Okay, we'll try back a little farther on the camera and see if that, and that way I can swing it over when you're playing. I can get at least the top of your head. I don't have to be on TV either. Well, I can't see your face, so you're safe. But, but people like to see, I've had other people comment that, that I've had, you know, I said at the beginning, People want to see the people in the pews, and then you've got people who don't want to be on Facebook, right. so I couldn't really yeah, do that. Yeah, right. yes. But uh, if people don't object, that still is, it gives people the idea of what it's like to be in church. Yeah. You have to you know, show the, the whole thing. It's like we tried to do the Christmas decorations. Yeah. And you still can't. It's not the same. I mean, yeah. when you have a picture or something, it's not the same as actually being here. Any news, anything going on in town that we should announce? Good, that's good news. At least nobody <laughs> died this week, right? Of course, I'm not, I'm not very up on what's going on by the way. So. That's not for whom the bell tolls. Universalist Church of New Madison uh, this chilly Sunday morning in January. Uh, we've had kind of a lull in the activity, so I think everybody got a chance to take a breath after a tumultuous beginning uh, to the new year. With everything that's happened, the inauguration went off without any violence, as far as I know. Uh, and I thought we could take a deep breath and relax, but we do have a trial coming up, so just take a deep breath and relax for a week and then, or two weeks, and then we'll be back in it again. Any announcements uh, or welcomes? The sparse crowd today, which is all right. Uh, everybody needs to stay safe. The new variant of the COVID uh, virus is evidently 60 to 70 percent more uh, able to spread itself. And some of the rumors or some of the information says it might even be a little more deadly. So we want to emphasize to everybody here and at home to wear your mask, disinfect your hands. My suggestion is if you're going out in public, get a pair of safety goggles like you wear during construction or wear your eyeglasses because that virus, those particles can penetrate through the soft uh, membrane, mucous membranes, which line your mouth. Your eyes are just as susceptible to that, so protect your eyes too. All right, opening words, Sanctuary of the Soul by David R. Chapman. To those of you who are visitors here for the first time, whether in person or on uh, video, thank you again for being with us. If you are lonely, here you will find warm companionship. Here, in this sanctuary of hope, you can find a new seat at the table of life. Feast yourself on love and fellowship. You will not hunger for the touch of a human hand or the embrace of your searching spirit. You might hunger for the touch of a human hand unless we all have gloves and, and uh, gowns on. If you are afraid or you have been abused, if you ache with fatigue, here you will find rest. You will be comforted, your spiritual wound will be dressed, and your courage will be returned to you. You will be led beside the still waters, and your soul will be restored. If you seek to understand, here you will be encouraged in your search. Wonderful pathways will be lit unto you, and wherever your journeys take you, you will know that you can always come home again to this place made sacred by our love for you. This is a sanctuary of the soul. There are no boundaries in this cathedral of hope. The collective wisdom of all humankind and our painful but glorious history are open to you here. 
Your heart and your mind need never struggle with one another in a unitary and universalist congregation. We have no fear of science. We have no fear of knowledge. If someday you decide to join us, you may feel what I have felt in the words of author Dorothy Lee Sayers. Quote, all of my life I've been wandering in the dark, but now I have found your heart and I am satisfied. And what do all the great words come to in the end but that? I love you. I am at rest with you. I have come home. That's from Sayers' novel, The Busman's Holiday. Prelude, please. nice. Where would we be without music? Thank you, Lloyd. And as usual, we're learning as we go along. If anyone has any suggestions or requests, how many times can you say to your church, I want this in church? Not very often. You can do that here. So if you have a request or a complaint or a suggestion as to how we can do this better, let us know. Uh, chalice lighting. Oh, actually, I always start with a slide background just because I get a kick out of that. You can probably guess what this is, the presidential seal, number 46. We were concentrating this week on the inauguration of the Biden-Harris ticket, uh, so all of our slides are going to be connected to that in one way or another, and we'll go to the... And as you know, uh, they began before inauguration even started with the commemoration for the 260,000 or 80,000, there's a huge number of people have died from COVID. Uh, and that was their first official, unofficial duty, was to have a commemoration for those families uh, who have suffered that, that loss. And just as a reminder where we came from, this is the Capitol, the, what, two and a half weeks ago? We hopefully will not see that again. Lighting a Chalice. This is the Community of Faith by Judas L. Quarles. Let me go ahead and strange these little rituals we have of lighting candles. I don't know where that came from. Probably in the Middle Ages when nobody had a candle. At this hour, in small towns and big cities, in single rooms, like at home watching your TV or your computer, in ornate sanctuaries, Many of our sibling Unitarian Universalist congregations are also lighting a flaming chalice. And you can light a candle at home on your own, or you can use an electric candle. 
As we light our chalice today, let us remember that we are part of a great community of faith. May this dancing flame inspire us to fill our lives with the Unitarian Universalist ideals of love, justice, and truth. Opening hymn is 114, the good old Christian hymn, Forward Through the Ages. Listen to the last verse. Not alone we conquer, not alone we fall. In each loss or triumph, lose or triumph all. Bound by God's far purpose in one living whole, move we on together to the shining goal. Forward through the ages in unbroken line, move the faithful spirits at the call divine. There's a lot of value in the lyrics, even though they're hundreds of years old. There's still something there. That's our opening hymn. For our opening hymn is, where are we here? I'm missing something. Affirmation. Community means strength. 
by Starhawk. And this is a view of the Capitol, which we don't normally see and we hope to not see again. Hopefully the fences and, and uh, all the defensive uh, items will be coming down. Community means strength by Starhawk. We are all longing to go home to some place. We have never, we have never been. A place half remembered and half envisioned. We can only glimpse, we can only catch glimpses of from time to time. The community. Somewhere there are people to whom we can speak with passion without having the words catch in our throats. Somewhere a circle of hands will open to receive us. Eyes will light up as we enter. Voices will celebrate with us whenever we come into our own power. Community means strength that joins our strength to do the work that needs to be done. Arms to hold us when we falter, a circle of healing, a circle of friends, somewhere where we can be free. That's from Dreaming the Dark, Magic Sex Politics, Beacon Press. I have to get that book. All right. And if you watched any of the televised proceedings of the inauguration, you know who this is. Uh, this is uh, Amanda Gorman. She's only, I think, 22 years old uh, and a poet laureate for the teenage youth group, something like that. Pretty amazing. So that's what we're going to do is read her poem, The Hill We Climb. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never-ending shade? She wrote this and finished it uh, during the tumultuous uh, January 6th with the invasion of the Capitol. The loss we carry, a sea we must wade. We brave the belly of the beast. We learn that quiet isn't always peace and the norms and notions of what just is isn't always justice. And yet the dawn is ours before we knew it and somehow we do it. Somehow we weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. We, the successors of a country and a time where a skinny black girl descended from slaves and raised by a single mother can dream of becoming president only to find herself reciting for one. And yet we are far from polished, far from pristine, but that doesn't mean we are striving to form a union that is perfect. We are striving to forge our union with purpose, to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, characters, and conditions of man. And so we lift our gaze, not to what stands between us, but what stands before us. We close the divide because we know to put our future first, we must put our differences aside. We lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms to one another. We seek harm to none and harmony for all. Let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true. That even as we grieved, we grew. That even as we hurt, we hoped. That even as we were tired, we tried. That we will forever be tied together victorious. Not because we will never again know defeat, but because we will never again sow division. Scripture tells us to envision that everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. If, we're up, if we are to live up to our own time, then victory won't lie in the blade, but in all the bridges we've made. That is the promise to glade the hill we climb if only we dare. It's because becoming or being American is more than a pride we inherit. It is the past we step into and how we repair it. We've seen a force that would shatter our nation rather than share it, would destroy our country if it meant delaying democracy. And this effort very, very nearly succeeded. But while democracy can be periodically delayed, it can never be permanently defeated. In this truth, in this faith, we trust. For while we have our eyes on the future, 
History has its eyes on us. This is the era of just redemption. We feared at its inception. We did not feel prepared to be the heirs of such a terrifying hour, but within it we found the power to author a new chapter, to offer hope and laughter to ourselves. So once a while we ask, how could we possibly prevail over catastrophe? Now we assert, how could catastrophe possibly prevail over us? We will not march back to what was, but move to what shall be, a country that is bruised but whole, benevolent but bold, fierce and free. We will not be turned around or interrupted by intimidation because we know our inaction and inertia will be the inheritance of the next generation, become the future. Our blunders become their burdens, but one thing is certain, if we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright. So let us leave behind a country better than the one we were left. Every breath from my bronze-pounded chest, we will raise this wounded world into a wondrous world. We will rise from the golden hills of the west. We will rise from the windswept northeast where our forebears first realized revolution. We will rise from the lake rim cities of the Midwestern states. We will rise from the sun-baked south. We will rebuild, reconcile, and recover. And every known nook of our nation and every corner called our country, our people, diverse and beautiful, will emerge battered and beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade of flame and unafraid. The new dawn balloons as we free it. There is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it if only we're brave enough to be it. Pretty remarkable for a 22-year-old. And she's got a real fashion sense, too. Okay, uh, that's the hill we climb. Jo joys and concerns. This is, a, is the, uh, because there's no population, there's no viewers, uh, no uh, visitors, no uh, people to watch, they actually put in flags of each state and interspace with the United States flags. It made a pretty amazing, if you watched any of the inauguration on the television, it was a pretty amazing spectacle. And unfortunately, I fell asleep before the fireworks because those are pretty incredible too, just from the spots I saw. Uh, joys and concerns, do we have any joys and concerns? And nobody said any from outside. Where's my, so we'll light a candle for the country. In the inauguration, we'll light a candle for the future. Upcoming up a couple weeks, going to be a, a terribly difficult time, particularly for those people who are divided in their loyalties to their party and their loyalties to their country. Uh, they have to decide which one takes preeminence, which one is the most prominent, which one will you give your life to. Uh, and for some of these people, that's going to be a very difficult choice. And we'll light one for those fears, joys, hopes, and desires that remain unspoken. Uh, I guess we need to throw this one in, too, for all of the people who are suffering from the COVID virus. Uh, this thing is spreading like wildfire. Uh, the hospital emergency rooms are full. California particularly is overwhelmed. They're using trailers to hold the deceased. Uh, this is a terrible time. And we're praying and hoping and giving our best efforts to making it better. Okay. Message. Do what you can. This is the second part of a message we had a couple weeks ago by uh, Peter Fredericks. And I forgot to write down what the first part was. Let's see if he talked about it. Uh, we'll just go through it and see. Today is the second of our three-part sermon series, which we might actually get to the third part eventually, dedicated to the Reverend Forrest Church. As I noted last week, Church spent nearly 30 years as the senior minister of All Souls Unitarian Universalist Church in New York City. He was a public theologian who authored 20 books in his lifetime, 
and was a frequent commentator in the public media. After being diagnosed with cancer of the esophagus, he sat down to write what he thought would be his last book, and the result was Love and Death, My Journey Through the Valley of the Shadow. Forest Church succumbed to this disease last September, and I don't know what the date was of this, maybe it'll be revealed, shortly before publication of his final work entitled The Cathedral of the World, A Universalist Theology. Ten years earlier, the church acknowledged that he was addicted to alcohol and he joined AA. As part of his recovery, he developed a mantra that he said served him well for the remaining years of his life. Parenthetically, put that together, he was an alcoholic and he had uh, cancer of the esophagus, a very common disease for alcoholics because of the disruptive behavior of alcohol. So if you're an excessive drinker, let me try and scare you a little bit. Uh, what, want what you have, do what you can, be who you are. This is his three statements. Want what you have, do what you can, be who you are. Last week we examined the statement, want what you have. This week, I would like to offer you my reflections on do what you can. So that's what we're going to do. Do what you can. This part of the church, of church's mantra, he tells us, interesting, and it's church's mantra, is his name church, so he obviously picked the right job, focuses, on our, focuses our minds on what is possible, no more, no less, thereby filling each moment with conscious, practical endeavor. In this simple statement, Church is at once acknowledging that we have the power and control over our destiny, while he is also acquiescing to the limitations and boundaries that we experience as human beings. He is oriented and orienting us toward the feasible and the achievable, knowing full well as individuals we are limited in our reach and scope. In one of the closing chapters of Love and Death, Church bemoans how much wasted energy we spend trying to do what we can't, and how often we fail to optimize our efforts and thereby achieve the significant goals that do lie within our power. He goes on to tell us, when we quit trying because we fail to achieve our pipe dreams, we overlook all we actually could accomplish by putting our shoulder squarely to the right wheel. That tells you how old he is. When's the last time you heard, put your shoulder to the wheel? When's the last time you had to push a horse cart out of the mud? When church instructs us to do what you can, he is calling us to let go of dreams of grandiosity. Let that sink in. Let go of dreams of grandiosity and to focus on the meaningful accomplishments we can achieve within the context of our everyday lives. This statement is reminiscent of the readings found in our hymnal written by the Unitarian minister Edward Everett Hale more than a century ago. I am only one, but still I am one. I cannot do everything, but still I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something that I can do. When, while I was reflecting on this simple statement, do what you can, my mind went back to the spring of 1989. The once monolithic Soviet bloc had begun to disintegrate and the Berlin Wall had begun to crumble. Students and other pro-democracy forces in China seized what they perceived to be an opportunity to pressure their government to loosen its iron grip on its people, and protesters flooded the streets of the capital, Beijing. The Chinese government, as you may recall, acted swiftly and violently to crush the peaceful protests, and hundreds, perhaps thousands, were killed. If you are like me, there is one image from the Tiananmen Square protest that is burned indelibly into your brain, one of the few images that survives from that time and place. It is the image of Tank Man. I should have put the picture up there. We call him Tank Man because his identity has never been known, at least to the Western world. In the video that was smuggled out of the country, we see a column of Chinese tanks rumbling down a street in central Beijing, and we see a lone man carrying a, what appears to be shopping bags step off the sidewalk into the path of the oncoming tanks. 
Instead of mowing him down as they easily could, the column comes to an abrupt halt in front of him. Tank man stands stock still in front of the lead tank, and the tank sits there idling. Then the lead tank tries to maneuver around the man. Each time it does, tank man moves sideways to block the tank's progress. Finally, the tank driver gives up and shuts down his engine. The two are at a standoff. This is the iconic image. A lone man standing up for human rights, staring down the barrel of a tank's gun, holding it at bay. Eventually, the members of the secret police arrived and removed Tank Man from the scene, and the tanks proceeded on their mission of death and destruction. But Tank Man left his mark. Do you remember uh, we had Rick Bohamus here? Uh, it's been months ago. He spoke about being in Israel. Do you remember the picture that we showed at that time? of the Israeli soldier pointing his rifle right at Rick, right at his camera, you could look down the barrel of the rifle. That behavior still goes on today. People still step up and do what is necessary, what is needed to do, what most of us would be terrified to do. We know, of course, that Tank Man did not bring down the Communist Party apparatus. We know the Chinese government suppressed the student protests with overwhelming force and violence. We also know that China remains one of the most oppressive countries on the face of the planet, severely limiting many of the freedoms that we here take for granted, and maybe don't take for granted now. And while we don't know for sure, we suspect that Tank Man paid for his actions with his life. I have no idea what triggered Tank Man to step off the curb and to stand his ground that day, but in one stark and startling moment, he did what he could. And for a few brief moments, it seems, one man had stopped the oppressive Chinese regime dead in its tracks. Last week, I mentioned that Marianne Williamson, quote, that has over the years been attributed to Nelson Mandela. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. Everybody remember who Marianne Williamson was? She was the person running for a Democratic candidate for president who came from Spaceship Nine or possibly some other planet, uh, but did occasionally make some kind of sense in a kind of weird way, and this is one of those things. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear, our deepest fear, is that we are powerful beyond measure. This statement is highly inspirational, and I think it speaks a truth but it is not entirely true. In some ways, a statement more about the limits of our imagination and self-perceptions than it is a statement about the extent of our power. The truth is most of us are not like Tank Man. The truth is that effort that most of us make is going, is going to be a drop in the bucket kind. But as you heard in today's reading, that drop just might really matter. Gordon McKeenan warns us against the unspoken assumptions of the drop-in-the-bucket mentality. We assume that a full bucket is what we're aiming for, and that until the bucket is full, nothing has been accomplished. And I love that question that hits us right between the eyes. Why is it that our image is of the first drop in the bucket? The implication being our drop may be the last drop, the one more drop that fills the bucket. In his book, Tipping Point, Malcolm Gladwell talks about how little things can make big differences. Using viruses, how apropos as a model for explaining social change, he tells us that a small change in behavior can alter the course of society. He writes that we are, as humans, heavily socialized to make a kind of rough approximation between cause and effect. Viruses and epidemics, both medical and social, do not work this way. In fact, he goes on, oftentimes the effect of a seemingly small cause can be huge. To appreciate the power of epidemics, he writes, we have to abandon this expectation of proportionality. We need to prepare ourselves for the possibility that sometimes big changes follow from small events, that sometimes these changes can happen very quickly. He encourages us to consider how we might start our own positive social epidemics. If any of you are aware of the butterfly effect, that's a little thing, a butterfly flapping its wings halfway across the world can set off infections in the currents and change the weather someplace else. 
interesting theory. This tipping point theory is dramatically demonstrated by the story of the 100th monkey. The 100th monkey. While not verified scientifically, the story is at least illuminating as a, illuminating as a parable. Back in the 1950s, scientists were studying the behavior of a certain type of monkey on an isolated island of Japan. They noted that most of the monkeys would eat the staple of their diet, sweet potatoes, fresh out of the ground. But then they observed that one monkey took a sweet potato down to the nearby shore and washed it in the water. Other monkeys on the island, watching this behavior, soon began to copy it. More and more monkeys began to wash their meals before eating them. And then something amazing happened. As we are told, once a critical mass of monkeys on the island was washing its sweet potatoes, the so-called 100th monkey, the same behavior began to occur in monkey, po monkey populations on other nearby islands, unconnected to the first colony. When a tipping point was reached, that somehow was communicated to the other monkey colonies with the message, wash your sweet potatoes. And they did, without Facebook or email. The point of all this is to say that by doing what we can, we are doing one thing for certain, and possibly another. First and for certain, we are having a local and immediate effect, whether it is making sure that a homeless family has a roof and meals to eat when we volunteer for the Interfaith Hospitality Network, or it is writing a letter to our representative in Harrisburg, he's obviously from Pennsylvania, to advocate for responsible gun control measures these actions have immediate effects and consequences. Secondly, perhaps less certainly, what we do when we what we do what when we do what we can, we are adding our drop to a bucket that may be nearly full, but that might be, that might be balanced on edge and is near the tipping point. We may be the 100th monkey whose action sparks an epidemic of social change. So there is something to aspire to. I want to be the 100th monkey. With all that being said, I ask you to notice that church's phrase, do what you can, has a Buddhist ring to it. It does not concern itself with consequences, and it asks us to release ourselves from attachment to outcomes. Do what you can, a simple imperative to act within the scope of our ability. Don't worry about the impact. That will take care of itself. While Forrest was eminently practical in his approach to life, he accepted that life is an ultimately profound mystery and that the impact of our lives cannot be known. In their work, How Can I Help, Ram Das and Paul Gordon tell us that service is ultimately a journey into the unknown. If we obsess over the effect of our actions, whether we're the first monkey or the 100th, the last drop in the bucket or the first, we may, because of the apparent futility, choose simply never to act at all. Das and Gorman tell us that we have a choice to make. We can either be frustrated and worn out by the uncertainty and doubt, they write, or try to find a way to be open to the ambiguity, to embrace it, to work with it, to be moved and inspired by it, and thereby come closer to the very heart of service where true freedom is found. This letting go of outcomes is embedded in Forest Church's simple statement, and it rings true to the statement of Jesus when after telling the parables of the Good Samaritan, he instructed the lawyer simply, go and do likewise. Ram Das says, we give it all we have and trust the rest to God to nature and to the universe. We do everything we can to relieve someone's suffering, but we are willing to surrender attachment to how we want things to be. And on that bright blue day in June of 1989, in a stunning act of courage, the tank man did what he could. He stood, <clears throat> he simply stood. He stood in front of a column of tanks, preventing their passage at least for a time. I doubt he thought he was going to bring the communist Chinese government to its knees. I doubt even that he thought the tanks were going to stop, but he did what he could do. He stood for freedom. He stood for justice. He stood for the oppressed people of the country, 
Let the image of this one courageous soul stand as an inspiration to us as we heed Forest Church's call to do what we can. Go and do likewise. Amen. And be blessed. Life is not a given, but a wondrous gift. This gift comes with a price attached. One day something will steal it from us. This does not diminish our lives. It increases their value. Fragility and impertinence, impermanence ensure life's preciousness. <coughs> and we can see an example. Uh, if you watched the activities of uh, January 6th, you might have seen the Capitol policeman who backed his way up the stairs, drew the protesters away from the open Senate door where uh, Vice President Pence and his wife and his daughter were hiding and drew them in another direction. One man who didn't stand, he backed his way into prominence. And as you saw at the inauguration, he was promoted to assistant sergeant of arms. He no longer wears a uniform, now he wears civilian clothes. But this one man has been re rewarded for his courage. Okay. Here we have the inauguration picture. There's a couple of these, just to kind of remind you. The Offering on a Difficult Morning by Elena Westbrook. Far too often, we are forced to confront the terrible things that people can do to one another. When these things happen, all we can do is come together in places like this church to remind ourselves that there is still hope, there is still love, there are still good-hearted people who can look unblinkingly into the storm and continue to believe a calm, bright morning will come. And not just in this church, at your home, if you're watching or thinking or being with us. <clears throat> this community is a refuge where we can keep the ember of hope alive when all the world seems intent on dousing it. And then we can use our little ember to light a beacon for the rest of the world. Our offerings each week sustain this community so we can share our small embers to light a dark world. Please give generously so that we can all together help spread that light. And as usual, you're welcome to put something in or keep something or take something out. doxology from all that dwell below the skies let songs of hope and faith arise let peace goodwill on earth be sung through every land by every tongue our closing hymn is 108 my life flows on in endless song
flows on in endless song. Well, Lloyd's done a really good job on picking here. My life flows on in endless song above earth's lamentation. I hear the real through the far off hymn that hails a new creation. Though all the tumult, through all the tumult and the strife, I hear the music ringing. It sounds an, an echo in my soul. How can I keep from singing? My sentiments exactly, although I don't sing in public. <laughs> But I do tap my toe. Oop, I guess there's nobody really to read it because everybody already knows it, so oop, it's too far. Closing hymn, 108, we have that, and that's uh, Vice President Harris and her First husband, is that what they're called now? First man? That's going to be interesting to see what happens there. And I have to have a little bit of humor. Does anybody recognize what this is? Vice President Pence, remember during the debate, there was a fly on his head? Does anybody, maybe you can't see it. If you've been watching the internet at all, this thing about Bernie sitting in a chair with his mittens is there are pictures of him sitting everywhere. I've seen him sitting on the girder in the 1930s, that girder that hangs above the Empire State Building when they were building it. He's sitting on the end of that. I've seen him sitting on a bench with Forrest Gump. <laughs> I've seen Bernie everywhere. And this one I just couldn't pass up. Bernie sitting on Mike Pence's head. So. Okay, closing words. Sacred Paths by Linda Susan Ulrich. Rivers and streams follow their own courses but the water molecules are indistinguishable. No one would confuse a candle flame for lava, yet in each the fire dances. An invisible force knocks down trees and holds birds aloft. The air remains indifferent to its uses. Diamond, desert, Denali, dirt, each tell their different stories, all with the earth as protagonist. Whatever our sacred paths, whatever our beliefs and practices, however we gather in community, we all honor the spirit of life, the spirit of compassion, the spirit of justice, the spirit of love. How many stars are in the sky? All of them. Postlude, please. Broadway for quite a while. So, 
say goodbye to Mike Pence and Bernie Sanders. <laughs> they both have white hair. That's about the only thing they have in common. Uh, thanks for being with us. Uh, if you need anything, any kind of assistance, if you just need spiritual support, let us know. Uh, goodbye from the First Universalist Church of New Madison. We hope to hear you or see you or communicate with you next Sunday. Wear your mask, wash your hands, uh, be safe out there.